appreciate it, Molly.
I don't got a picture. Stand in front of the camera, take your picture, because you're about to get arrested. Oh, I was asking what's his question. He said, I don't have a So maybe you can help me. Why don't you ask yours, Robbie? I don't have any plans, Robbie. If you don't want to be hot, you're going to kill me. I'll go with it. Anyway, I'll go with it. Yeah, you know what I mean? What? I'll go with it. I'll go with it. I'll go with it.
that was that was this guy, right? That we built. How many oxygen atoms? How many silicone atoms? Why is this important? Mark, did you hear Timmy's comment? No, you would be a lot of Timmy's. A lot of stuff A lot of the structures that form in the magma are based on this, the silicon oxygen tetrahedron. That's kind of the basis for the minerals that form for igneous rocks. Talked about these eight elements that show up inside of most of the magma, right? Silicon, oxygen, calcium, aluminum, potassium, iron, magnesium. Did I get them all? What did I miss? You know what I missed? Sodium. Thank you. They're all up there. Silicon, calcium, oxygen, magnesium, aluminum, sodium, potassium, iron. You need to know about those. So if we were to take, what I'm saying is, if we were to take this liquid out of here, which is not propellant, it's just water, and we were to do a chemical analysis of what's in here, what would we find out was in it? Water and propellant. It's just water. There's no propellant. Well, the no, it's in there, obviously. So just have what would be in it? Hydrogen and oxygen. Mm -hmm. And a little tiny bit of some other stuff, right? Because our water has impurities in it. And your backwash. But it would be pretty much hydrogen and oxygen. If we take a sample out of the magma chamber, which, believe it or not, people do that. There are crazy geologists who work on volcanoes who go out into the field with protective clothing on and very special equipment, and they essentially go out to a volcano and dip in a sample collection tube into the magma that's a thousand degrees Celsius and pull it out and capture that and take it back to the lab and analyze it. You should do that. That's how we know. I would love to do that. Wouldn't that be cool? That's how we know what's in this magma. How else do we know what's in here? The gases. The gases give us some clue, but are any of these things gases? Which ones? Oxygen. Is anything else on there a gas? No. Okay. So how else might we know what's in there besides the gases that are coming out? What record do we have of what's in there? Magma escapes from the vent. Good. Do that one. <laughs> Isn't this just a frozen, frozen version of the magma? Yeah. Magma is liquid. This is solid. It's the same thing. Wouldn't it be the same if I took liquid water and analyzed it chemically, and I took ice and analyzed it chemically? Would they get the same results? Yeah. If I melted this rock, it would be magma. Exactly. Okay. You okay with that? Okay, so how does the magma turn into the rock? What happens? Now we got to think about when we were in the back of the room, we all had our little cards, we were going around, and what were we looking for? Yeah. Pairs. Our pairs. We were looking for our pairs. They had what? Opposite charges. And we were looking for our pairs. And what happened? When we found our pairs, they turned into minerals. And if we have an assemblage of minerals, okay, what does assemblage mean? A big group, like an assembly, a big group of people, an assemblage of minerals. So if you put multiple pieces of minerals together, what do they form? A solid that we would call an igneous rock. Okay, so maybe someplace on here, up at the top or over here, maybe someplace you need to write the definition of an igneous rock. So what is the definition? 
condition of an igneous rock. Rock that's formed by the cooling of magma, a rock that's formed by the solidification of magma. What does it mean? Put it in your own words. I can't even see what that is. But I know, you write it in your own words. Okay. You, you don't need to see the text. You know You're writing the definition of an igneous rock. It's a rock that's formed by the cooling of magma. Or, if you like it better, it's a rock that contains an assemblage of minerals formed from magma. Okay. We're okay with the rest of this, right? And then remember one of the last things we did was we wrote down this progression of the way things formed. So the first one we had formed was olivine. Do you have this on yours? Yeah. The second one was pyroxene, and then amphibole, and then biotite, and then potassium feldspar. Most of like quartz, and over here on the right, we had calcium rich feldspar to sodium rich feldspar. Yeah. Huh? You're going to know it. You'll learn this. Don't worry. This thing, if you still have some room around it, this thing has a special name. It is called Bowen's Reaction Series. if you took a magma and let it cool down. So here's what he did. He took rock, he melted it. He let it cool down a little bit. He removed the part that had crystallized. He analyzed the chemical composition of that. He let the rest of it cool down a little bit more. He took that out. He analyzed the composition. He let it cool down more and he took that out. He analyzed the chemical composition. And that's what he found out, is that is the order that the minerals form in. What that does for us is it allows us to predict what minerals we will find together in rock. Do you still have room up here? Yeah. If I were you, I would write my Bowen's reaction series, predict minerals in rock. together in a rock. So if we look at a rock and we say the rock has olivine in it, then we would look at other minerals that form at about the same temperature, and we would look for those minerals in the rock. We would not look for other minerals way down here that form at different temperatures. They do not form together in the same rock. Does that make sense? Okay. If you take this piece of paper and you flip it over, it all led through on the other side, or can you still work on the other side? Yours looks like this, and it's falling on the entire sea, and I want you to go back and get a second sheet. Yours is really flat through, go get another sheet. Thank you. 
means that the energy of those atoms is continuing to decrease, right? Hotter it is, the more they move around. The lower the temperature, the less they move around. So what's happening with these silicon oxygen tetrahedra is that they're crashing into each other. And they're starting to share an oxygen atom with each other. So you get tetrahedra that join together. And if we count up the number of oxygens here, let me count the number of oxygens quickly. Seven. Seven. How many silicones? Two. Okay. Each silicon oxygen tetrahedron originally had four oxygens. This has two tetrahedra together, but it only has seven oxygens. Okay? So they're sharing oxygen. They're using oxygen way more efficiently. That means they're going to be able to make more structures. Put it away. Turn it off. Whatever. This thing floats around and it captures more of these units. And what ends up happening is you get a long string of them. There could be millions of atoms in length. Can you believe a million atoms all long string? Think about a piece of hair. A long string of these tetrahedra all attached to each other, all sharing oxygen. That's floating around inside the magma chamber, and it is attracting magnesium and iron atoms. And that's what forms the pyroxene. So what we're going to do here is we're going to say, we're going to put pyroxene over here. And we're not writing out the formula, because it gets too long. We, we write too many chemical formulas. We don't really care that much about them. But what we are going to write is we're going to write single chain. Single, long single chain of the silicon oxygen tetrahedra. Now we're going to find ways to represent the way these look. So I'm going to draw a single chain for you. All I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a straight line like that. This is kind of the line that is all of the oxygens that are lined up being shared, one after another after another. And then see how this looks like triangles sticking up and triangles sticking down, kind of? Yeah. I'm going to draw this in here like this. So I'm going to have a triangle going up, and then a triangle going down, and then another triangle going up over here. This is going to make sense in a minute. The corner of each one of these triangles, so here and here, 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 here. All those corners of the triangles, those are oxygen atoms that are all being shared. And then there's one more oxygen in the center. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show the oxygen in the center by drawing in a line to the center of the structure. <coughs> Chambers 
are such cooperative places. We've got lots of these chains, these long single chains floating around, and they bump into other long single chains and they're not very energetic anymore because now the temperature is down to about 1,000 degrees. So it's really cooling off in there. And what do you think the single chains do? They bond with each other. They start to share oxygen, so you're not using up as much oxygen anymore. And so they form what we're going to call a double chain. So here's how you're going to draw your double chain structure. You're going to draw two parallel lines like that. And then you're going to draw in your zigzags but you're going to draw them in so that they shear in the middle. So you can imagine lots of these double chain structures floating around and the temperature keeps decreasing. Now you've used up all the magnesium and all the iron. There's none of it really left. So we have some other things that we're going to form. What's the next thing on the list that's going to form? Biotite. Okay, 
and that's about what they would look like. But they would go on for millions and millions of atoms in every direction. And still cooling down the magma chamber, what did we form next? After the biotites. We started to form potassium feldspar, right? Potassium feldspar. We can write case bar. I'm a lot more comfortable with that considering I probably spoke potassium wrong. It's got two S's, doesn't it? Yeah. That's what I thought. Mr. Simon needs to give us a quiz on how to spell them. Maybe mm -hmm. we should have one of those. <laughs> All right, we're going to talk about more than just potassium feldspar here. Because we had other feldspars on our list, didn't we? Yeah. What were they? Caltrain. We had sodium feldspar here. And we had calcium feldspar up here, right? Yeah. Okay, this is the this is the weird thing in the Lewis reaction series. Because what we've been saying so far is we started out with a very simple structure, the silicon oxygen tetrahedron, which shared with another tetrahedron to make it more efficient at using silicon and oxygen, and then those shared to make a chain and a double chain and sheets. What happens if we've got all these sheets floating around? How could they share to be more efficient? Two-dimensional sheets, what could they do? Stack up to be a three-dimensional structure, right? So we're going to call this a three-dimensional framework. Three-dimensional framework, where you've got sheets stacked on top of sheets stacked on top of sheets in all directions. Now the weird thing is, is that some feldspar the feldspar that is calcium-rich feldspar, some of it forms at really high temperatures. Some of it forms at much lower temperatures. So here's what we have to think about. Why, when there are single tetrahedra and single chains and double chains forming at these temperatures, why are there also frameworks, three-dimensional frameworks? forming at those temperatures. Does that complicate what's going on in the magma chamber? It does, right? But that's what we find. How do we know that? Because here are the rocks we find. We find rocks like this one, this dark colored rock. It's a mafic rock. And it's got olivine pyroxene and calcium feldspar in one rock. Okay? And that's how we know that it actually happens at that temperature. So we have all the feldspars forming three-dimensional frameworks. One other thing I want to tell you about calcium feldspar to sodium feldspar. Does anybody have granite countertops at home? Yeah. Yeah. Black, 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 black. black big crystals or black, black little crystals? Black big crystals. Big crystals. The black big crystals really isn't granite. It's really this stuff. And if you go home and you look at those countertops really, really closely, and you look for some minerals that are very shiny, they look like they might have some dark blue color in them, that's the calcium feldspar. I got scared. Who's got granite countertops at home that are light colored or kind of orangey colored? Anybody? I have white ones. That's this, or white ones, is it granite or is it marble? I don't know. It, it might be marble. Wow. The light color ones are the minerals down here. Okay? <laughs> and what you'll find out is that if you look at the granite, what they're calling granite in countertops or in floors, you will find feldspars from the calcium, the sodium, and stuff in between. So I could actually take magma that had this stuff in it and cool it down, and I would get a different feldspar all along here. Just from the cooling. Just from the cooling. Wow. So the way I'm going to explain this to you guys is, did you ever drink an Ar Arnold Palmer? Of course, yeah. What is it? Good. Lemonade and iced tea. So let's start out. I got just iced tea over here and just lemonade over here. I could mix 50-50. I would get an Arnold Palmer in the middle, right? Yeah. Or I could mix 
mostly iced tea and just a tiny bit of lemonade, or I could mix mostly lemonade with a tiny bit of iced tea. Right? I could mix any any percentages in that spectrum between pure lemonade and pure iced tea. Correct? Yeah. I can do the same thing here. You can have pure calcium feldspar or a pure sodium feldspar or anything in between. And it changes from being a really pretty bluish gray color to being white. How about a press? You, you get a press. gradual, yeah, right. You get a gradual change in color. Okay? All right, last couple on here. What's after feldspar, potassium feldspar? Muscovite. Yeah, two more, right? Muscovite. Muscovite? Yeah. It's already up here, right? Sheet structure. And then the last one? It's already up there because quartz is also a 3D framework. Why those minerals are found in the same rocks? 
Why do make the crops have those minerals only?
consider the different types of rocks, mafic, intermediate, and felsic. Talk through that stuff with your partner. Write down your questions. I'll give you a couple minutes. <laughs> we are doing the same thing we did at the beginning of the day, just on this side. Hopefully we still remember how to do it. If you think you're feeling really good about this, then go ahead and stick in the idea of what's going on in the magma chamber and see if you can talk through with your partner, starting out with a magma chamber full of magma, what happens. You start cooling it down, what changes happen in the motion, what things bond first, what do they form, what kind of rocks do they form. See if we can get all the way through this, really processing it. By the way, let me give you guys a clue. In about three or four minutes, I'm giving you a writing prompt, and you're going to have to write on it. If you've processed it orally now, it will be much easier on you then. So talk through it. Talk through it well.
Oh. So let's go. When you get there, get out a piece of paper, a white piece of paper, and put your name on the top. down as you can, out of your own brain. The way for you to look and see if you can really get this stuff up. Yeah, that you can do this. 